The teaching that you're about to hear this morning is part of our year-long campaign that we are calling the Year of Biblical Literacy. You can find out more over on our website at midtownbiblicalliteracy.com. And there you can find reading plans, resources, podcast episodes, all in an effort to help us raise our understanding of the Bible. So with that in mind, enjoy this teaching. Our scripture today is a selection from the book of Proverbs. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It is better to be of lowly spirit with the poor than divide the spoil with the proud. Haughty eyes and a proud heart, the lamp of the wicked, are sin. One's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. This is the word of the Lord. Hey, I'm Michelle, your communications director. I'm spending the next couple of Sundays at both our downtown and Lexington churches to ask people about wisdom. Let's hear what they have to say. What is a time where you ignored someone's advice and highly regretted it? Ooh, when I was almost graduating from high school, I lucked my way into a situation where I basically had a new-ish car completely paid off and I decided to trade it in on something that was cool and used and came with a big payment. Uh, I regretted that (laughs) pretty badly for a while. Time when somebody gave me great advice and I ignored it was definitely uh, my old boss who is a Christian and he was like, as you go out and start your own company, do your due diligence and I did not. And we face planted immediately. (laughs) Uh, I think I was just very arrogant. I was like, well, whatever my hands touch, it's gonna be gold. And I really wish I would have listened to that because that would have saved me a lot of heartache. Time when I was given great advice, but in the moment I didn't listen to it. You know, it's just so hard to think about the last time I made a bad decision. One mistake we made in life is buying a brand new car um, because after that, we knew that that was a really bad choice and we really hope our kids don't make them the same mistake. Yeah, we enjoyed it for about 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. There was a there was a time in college where I bought a pair of cowboy boots and I paid them off like three years later. So I paid like $1,000 for these cowboy boots on a credit card that I shouldn't have that many people told me not to do. <laughs> if you could go back to your 18 year old self and give yourself some words of wisdom, what would it be? Um, Don't always think about what you want now. Uh, It's easy to prioritize what you want now. Um, Sometimes what you want later uh, requires harder work now and thinking about how that will impact you beyond just today. Amen. Good morning. Thousand dollar cowboy boots? I didn't know. I did not know. All right, grab your Bible, flip open to Proverbs chapter one. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here with you. Uh, While you are flipping there, uh, I want you, I want to do a little internal, in your mind, crowd exercise. Uh, while you're flipping to Proverbs 1, I want you to think of a really proud person. Someone you know. Someone who's, you know, self-consumed, smug, overly sure of themselves, always for no seeming apparent reason. I'll give you a second, all right? Kind of look at me when you got someone in mind. You got, got a really proud person in mind? And while you're thinking of it, can we just say proud people are the worst, am I right? Ugh. Like, even if it's someone you like, like their pride is the worst thing about them, right? I have great news for you this morning. This sermon is, is going to help them. As soon, as soon as the link is up, you can send it right on over to them. And I, it's up to you. I probably wouldn't tell them. You were the person who came to mind when he asked his question at the beginning. I mean, you do you, but... I also have some bad news. Not nearly enough of us thought of ourselves. It's actually one of the worst aspects of pride is that it it makes it where we see it really sharply in other people. And it's a lot harder to see it in ourselves. And that's troubling because biblical wisdom literature says that pride is enemy number one in your life. It's the biggest thing that's causing friction in your relationships. It's the biggest thing driving frustration and discontentment in your work, in your circumstances. It's one of the biggest things preventing you from growing in wisdom and becoming a person of wisdom. So the wisdom books, and Proverbs in particular, spend a huge amount of time 
on pride. At least two-thirds of the chapters in Proverbs speak about pride directly, sometimes referring to the proud as the simple or the fool or the scoffer. And throughout Proverbs, as you read all these different Proverbs, you start to see this paradox about pride. Here's the paradox we'll start with. If you think you're wise, you're a fool. But if you know you lack wisdom, sometimes if you're painfully aware of where you lack wisdom, you are on your way to becoming wise. You see the paradox? It's interesting. In other words, pride is anti-wisdom. Pride is anti-wisdom. It, it rejects growing in wisdom. And Proverbs 1, right out of the gate, tells us why. So we'll start in Proverbs 1, starting in verse 1. We'll kind of skip through a little bit of Proverbs 1, starting in verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise, okay, pause. What's that next word? Let the wise what? Hear. Let the wise hear. Let the wise listen. Mark that word. Skip down to verse Eight. And I want you to tell me again, what's the first word in verse 8? Hear. Once again, same word. Hear. Listen. Hear, my son, your father's instructions. Skip down to verse 20. The author paints this really gripping picture. Verse 20. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the market, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. That's a gripping picture to personify wisdom as this woman crying out in the streets. Would anyone like some wisdom? Anyone tired of being simple and proud and foolish? I'll give you God's wisdom, his spirit. Just ask. But what happens? We'll come back to it, but verse 24 through the rest of the chapter tells us that they refused to listen and they wrecked their lives as a result. Like I said, we'll come back to that. Here's our big idea for now. Listening, hearing is a prerequisite for wisdom. The posture of a learner, a listener, humility is a prerequisite, but pride says, no, I'm good. I'm smart on my own. I have to listen to my heart and do what makes me happy. My gut tells me where to go. Can nobody tell me what to do? I already know. So with that warning in mind, let me just give you, here's our, our outline for today. Here's what we're going to see from Proverbs on pride today. Number one, we're going to see the nature of pride. Number two, we're going to see the danger of pride. And number three, we're going to get the antidote to pride. The nature of pride, what it is, the danger of pride, where it goes, and the antidote to pride, how do we be free of it? Let's start with number one, the nature of pride, what it is. We'll, we'll kick off in Proverbs 6, 16 through 17. This is the first little bit of verse 17. Here we go. It says, there are six things that the Lord hates. That's, that's strong language right out of the gate. God hates six things exactly. Seven that are an abomination to him. Six or seven things God hates. First one on the list, haughty eyes. It's the first one on the list of things that are abominations to God. That's big kind of old school, Old Testament theological language. What that means is they're things that disgust God. Things that singe his nostrils. Haughty eyes, also known as pride, is number one on the list. That's a big deal. That's very strong language. Maybe you didn't even know that God hates things. He does. And pride is top of the list. Why? Well, haughty eyes are eyes. We don't really use that language these days. But haughty eyes are eyes that are turned up and looking down their nose at others in, in superiority and judgment. I'll give you another verse on, on haughty eyes. Look at Proverbs 21.4. It says, haughty eyes and a proud heart, the lamp of the wicked are sin. So it connects haughty eyes to a proud heart, and it says they're the lamp of the wicked. What, what does that mean? That, that means they're how you look at the world. You go through life with this lens of pride, looking down on others. And, and that becomes the first thing we see from Proverbs about the nature of pride. Pride needs to feel better than others. 
It needs to feel better, better than others. It needs to look down on others. And this shows up in tons of ways. I, I'm, I'm smarter than other people. I'm more fit or more attractive. I'm prettier than, I'm, I'm more successful than you, or I'm funnier than you. I'm more hip and savvy and fashionable. I'm more popular. I'm more educated. I'm more caring. I see politics right. Like There's going to be a lot of pride politically in the upcoming year. Buckle up. It's going to be fun. Um, and it's going to rip relationships apart, but we're not talking about that right now. Let's keep going. Here's the thing. People aren't really proud of being rich or smart, but being richer or smarter than someone else. The comparison is what makes you proud, being above the rest, or, or at least not being inferior to the rest. There's a competitive nature to it. That's the first thing we learn about the nature of pride. Pride has to feel better than others. Here's the second one. We see it in Proverbs 8.13. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance in the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. So once again, this is super strong language. The fear of the Lord is to hate the evil things he hates and pride and arrogance. Once again, they're number one on the list. Okay, why? Well, there's actually a massive clue for us here in the Hebrew word that's translated as arrogance here. It's the Hebrew word ga'on. Everyone say ga'on. And if you felt silly doing that, that's good. That's how we beat down our pride, okay? Um, Ga'on is the same Hebrew word used for pride in Proverbs 15.25 and Proverbs 16.19. But normally, Ga'on does not mean pride. Normally, this is a word reserved for God. It's a word that means exalted, majesty, glory. But that's what pride does, right? Pride takes the weight of glory and majesty that should belong to God alone, and it tries to place it on ourselves. That's the second thing we learn about the nature of pride. Pride puts us in God's rightful place. Pride makes us look to ourselves for identity, for meaning, for purpose, for supremacy, for okayness, for authority in our lives. But that's God's role. That's not our role in our lives. And and this is ancient, okay? It's what Satan dangled in front of Adam and Eve when sin entered the planet. He said, don't you want to be like God? Don't you want to have God's role? And when they bit, they bit on pride-poisoned fruit. See, humanity's created state was one of correct humility. We saw God correctly. We saw our need and our dependence on God correctly. We weren't full of ourselves. So we could be filled with his love and his patience and his joy and his truth and his wisdom. We lived in humble dependence on God, but pride rejects all of that. Pride stiff arms God and pushes him out. And so in this way, pride is not just sin, but the root of all sin. It's where it starts and where it comes from. I love this quote from Lewis Meads. He said, he says, pride is the arrogant refusal to let God be God. It is to grab God's status for oneself. In the vivid language of the Bible, pride is puffing yourself up in God's face. Pride is turning down God's invitation to join the dance of life as a creature in his garden and wishing instead to be the creator, independent, reliant on one's own resources. Never does pride want to pray for strength, ask for grace, plead for mercy, or give thanks to God. Because pride's doing it on your own. I don't have room for God or need for him. This is why God hates pride. It's also why the proud hate God. Whether they would say they do or not, whether they realize it or not, whether they do it in a religious way or an irreligious way, pride both breaks our relationship with God and it also tries to fix the problem by puffing ourselves up and making ourselves worthy. But in the process, it pushes God out with self-righteousness. One more quote that I love on this comes from C.S. Lewis. He says, the problem is when you come up against God, you come up against a being in which you are entirely inferior in every regard. Your pride demands that you have nothing to do with him. As long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people, those, those haughty eyes. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. 
proud, haughty eyes are always looking down, but God is up, reigning in glory, in majesty. And this also shows us one last important note on the nature of pride. Pride is self-consumed. Pride is self-consumed. So pride is not just thinking too highly of yourself. It's thinking of yourself too much at all. We, the proud self is constantly aware of itself. It's desperately aware of itself. It's always thinking about how I'm looking, how I'm doing, how I'm performing, how I'm being treated. I'll give you an illustration that I found helpful. Um, our body parts do not call attention to themselves unless something is wrong. Like, here's what I mean. I, I never come home at the end of the day and Erica says, hey, how was your day today? And I said, it was the most amazing day. My right elbow worked correctly all day today. Look at it extend. <laughs> and it bends right back. It reached for pencils and books. Incredible. No, I don't ever think about my right elbow unless something's wrong with it. But, but pride is always drawing attention to itself, isn't it? I've been snubbed. I've not been respected. I've not been sought out. Well, yeah, I did hurt that person and run away from my community, but they didn't chase me hard enough. So it's really their fault. Wait, what? What in the name of pride are we? And here we see one of the sneakiest things about pride. Insecurity and low self-esteem are actually a form of pride. See, we tend to think of pride as swagger and arrogance. But low self-esteem is still focused on you. You get down on yourself, you beat yourself up, you hate yourself even, but you're still thinking about yourself the whole time. The difference between you and someone who feels superior is you're just convinced that you're losing, but you're both playing the same competitive game. Pride is self-consumed. Okay, let's summarize. From Proverbs, we see that pride is the competitive, self-focused root of sin that pushes God out and prioritizes our own sufficiency and supremacy. Now that right there, that's a very big definition. Let me, let me try to bring all that down and make it more practical by giving you a number of ways that you might see or recognize pride in your own life. This will not be fun. Um, comparison pride. We already kind of mentioned this one. You compare your intelligence, your ability, your looks, your maturity to the people around you. And if you're better than them, you feel proud. Now, now hear me. It is okay to know what you're good at. The goal here is not false humility. We're like, oh, I'm not good at anything. <laughs> I'm so spiritually mature. I'm just not good at anything. No, no, no. You can know what you're good at so long as you remember that every gift you have is a good gift from a good God who gave it to you. So then you don't take pride in it. You're grateful for it. You're, you receive it with humility. All right, now some of us do this comparison thing in a really loud and braggadocious way. Hey, everybody, look at me. I'm the best. Others of us do it in a much more internal way. You just have a constant low-grade judgmental inner dialogue. You're always paying attention to who around you is not quite as good at things as you are. I'll ask some, some questions here. Uh, are you a sore loser or a sore winner? Both are pride. Do you constantly feel the need to one-up people? Hey, that was a great story. I got a better one. Good joke. Funnier one. I got a funnier one. Let me tell you a funnier one. Uh, the amount that you complain reveals your pride. Because complaining says these circumstances aren't good enough for me, but Jesus, God of the universe, bent down to scrub dirt off of his disciples' feet, including Judas who betrayed him. So remind me again what circumstances are below us. Are you easily or frequently offended? It's just, I can't believe they said that. Why not? People say all kinds of stupid stuff. Your pride is what can't believe it. Are you easily angered or annoyed? It's pride. Do you have a hard time taking a joke? Likely pride. Do you love to tell jokes that sometimes are pretty mean? Not me, you. Pride. If your feelings are hurt, is your first instinct to jab back? Do you have unresolved conflict in your life because you won't own your contribution to the conflict? You won't apologize. You won't ask for forgiveness. Or you do that kind of fake apology thing where it's like, oh yeah, I'm sorry that you felt that way. No, that's not, mm -mm, that's pride. That's what that is. 
When you are corrected, is your first reaction to defend yourself or to attack the other person or to write them off because they aren't as smart or as wise or as mature as you? Do you uh, frequently need to be the center of attention? Like, do you start to feel uneasy if no one's listening to you? Do you just generally feel the need to voice all your thoughts and opinions? Okay, this, this is a hard one. Those ones have all been easy. This is a hard one. Can you rejoice when someone else gets a good thing even if you really wanted it? Even if you think you deserve it more or need it more than them? If you can't rejoice, it's pride. Uh, if you're prayerless, you believe you are self-sufficient, which is pride. If you have secret sin in your life, then that means you're more concerned with how people see you than the reality of how God sees you, which is pride. Not spiritual pride. I look down on others who aren't as spiritually mature as I am. I don't want to be in people in a life group with people who aren't as awesome as I am. They don't know what I know. They're not as disciplined as I am. Yeah, but what do you have that you didn't receive as a gift of grace? How are we doing? Anybody else getting lit up or just me? Just me? Worst case possible, you're sitting here through that whole list and you're thinking, no, not me. I'm good on all of that. Oh my gosh, that's the worst pride of all. You can't see it. Point two, the danger of pride. Where it leads, where does pride take us? Proverb rings this warning bell over and over and over again. I'm gonna read you a bunch. Try to write them down if you can. Just write down the references. Proverbs 3.34. Towards the scorners, he is scornful. That's God. But to the humble, he gives favor. Proverbs 11.2. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with the humble is wisdom. Proverbs 15.25. The Lord tears down the house of the proud, but maintains the widow's boundaries. 16.5. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is offensive to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. 16.18 through 19. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It is better to be of lowly spirit with the poor than divide the spoil with the proud. Proverbs 29.23. One's pride will bring him low but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. Are we catching the theme here? Pride goes before destruction. Pride leads to disgrace. Pride brings you low. God punishes the proud. Okay, but why? I mean, is pride really that big of a deal? Like, just look at confidence? Like, why? What, how, why is this the pattern, the warning that the scriptures give? I'll give you a couple reasons. The first ones are very practical and pragmatic reasons, okay? Um, in pride... We refuse to learn from our mistakes because the proud think they're good on their own. Like we said up front, pride won't listen. So like, think about this. Have you ever seen or known someone doing something stupid, but they won't listen to you? And they do the stupid thing you tried to warn them about and it brings chaos and pain, but you love them. So saying, I told you so doesn't even feel good, which if it did feel good, that'd be pride. Parents, is there anything more infuriating than your kids not listening when they are dead wrong and you are 100% right and their pride leads them to pain? You try to tell them, but they won't hear. Proud ears won't hear. There's a really bad idea that floats around sometimes that says the only way to learn is from your own mistakes. It's a really bad idea. Now, Now, of course, your mistakes can be a great teacher. But, but the wisdom literature tells us there's another great teacher, which is other people's mistakes. I actually, there's another way to put it. I actually lobbied for this to be the subtitle of our wisdom series. I wanted it to be wisdom, letting other people pay your stupid tax. <laughs> Y'all know what that is? A stupid tax is the price you pay for a lack of wisdom. It's the cost of mishandling a situation due to a lack of knowledge or experience. So once upon a time, a guy very much like me in every way, hypothetical, different guy, uh, I knew, but it was me, I knew some people who were doing really well investing in these things called um, stocks. Is that the word? There might be storks. I don't really know. Stocks, something like that. Specifically, they were investing in some things known as penny stocks. And so I talked to Eric and I said, I want to take a reasonably small portion of our savings and I want to invest it like these people are doing and we're going to win lots of money and it's going to be awesome. And she wisely and hesitantly said, 
I guess. Uh, and then I did what's known as, um, in the industry, what I've now come to find out, I did what's called buying high and selling low. <laughs> yeah. I paid a literal stupid tax. And, and I just didn't know what I was doing. And Erica, to this day, she likes to remind me of those losses, which, to be fair, is her pride. <laughs> and... Uh, what I just did is called deflection, which is my pride. And... But humility, it, it dodges a lot of that because humility is wise enough to look for input, to listen, to critique, to learn from other people's mistakes. Humility is happy to let other people pay the stupid tax for you. But pride won't because you think you know better. You trust your own heart and you lean on your own understanding too much. I'll give you another uh, stupid tax illustration that, that's a pretty good picture of just the proud life overall. Uh, I was once at one of our old houses, I was building a tree house for my kids. And I like to go big when I do things. So it was like this big platform up between three huge trees. I mean, this thing was like 16 by 20 feet. It was going to be a large room in the trees. And um, I I'd, I'd kind of built the frame for it. And I, was, I, was, I, I needed to get up from under and, and put some joist hangers in the joists. And so I climbed up on this ladder that wasn't exactly on level ground. Anybody else ever try this little maneuver? And like, I've, I've been on a ladder before. I, I, I've seen other people on wobbly ladders. I could have so easily just asked someone, hey, will you come stand at the bottom of this and put a foot on it? But it was cool. I got it. I'm fine. What's worse is it was an A-frame ladder and I climbed up to the very top where I'm literally straddling the top, my feet were on or above the rung that says, do not stand on or above this rung. And with, I mean, the smallest of the most imperceptible movements, I, I feel the ladder just go, just topples out from under me. And now I'm hanging on to these joists. And I don't know if you can tell from the everything about me, but I'm not great at pull-ups. And um, <laughs> there's this sharp, metal of this joist hanger actively, the harder I try to hold on, it's digging into my arm. It's cutting me. I'm watching myself bleed, trying to not fall. And I'm screaming my head off for someone to come. And eventually someone comes and they put the ladder back up under me and I, I run down and, and I literally have the scars of that stupid tax. God in the Proverbs is telling us that he has set the world up in a way that pride is a bit like that. In our pride, we're always climbing, we're always trying to elevate ourselves, but we're standing on a really wobbly ladder. We're standing on a rung where he has said, do not stand on or above this rung. And it takes so little for that to topple over. We ignore the good advice or the critique of good friends. It blows up in our face and we end up paying a stupid tax that we could have easily avoided with a little more humility to listen. We complain and we compare ourselves to others and we belittle them with just a joke until we find our relationships topple. They end up wounded or even worse, destroyed. We we can play the insecurity, low self-esteem card so much that loved ones start to have a hard time knowing when to take us seriously or not. And that is not a place you want to be to go through life. As a pastor who has walked with people for decades now, I hate seeing pride bring destruction and disgrace. But I can tell you the Proverbs are true. It always does over and over in a thousand different ways, big and small. So that's, that's the practical, pragmatic reason that pride leads to destruction and a fall and, and disgrace. But there's another way in which pride leads to destruction that's, that's fascinating and, and even a little bit scarier. It's what we might call a cosmic reason that pride leads to a fall. I, I wonder if you noticed in those Proverbs we just read, God's activity in some of them. Because these aren't all just truisms about how the world works. Look back at Proverbs 15.25. The Lord tears down the house of the proud, but maintains the widow's boundaries. So that's just not a, normally that guy's house falls down. It's like, no, the Lord's doing it actively. Proverbs 3.34, towards the scorners, he is scornful. But to the humble, he gives favor. Proverbs 16.5, everyone who is arrogant in heart is offensive to the Lord. Be assured he will not go un. 
punished. What, what's going on here? The Lord tears down the proud's house. He's scornful to the scorn, or he's scornful to the scorner. He be assured he will punish the arrogant. Now, now, I need you to hear something here, or you'll be quite confused throughout life. Certainly, this isn't just talking about here on earth. It's more than that, because there are plenty of proud people living in mansions that are not falling down. There's plenty of scorners who go scorn proudly right up to their deathbeds. The arrogant and rich often actually are the ones who know how to abuse earthly systems of justice to avoid punishment. These Proverbs are not talking about just here on earth. God is warning us, you're actually not getting away with anything. Whatever in your pride you think you're getting away with, you're not hiding that from me. Of course, this broken world doesn't always get justice perfectly, but someday I will. See, pride's whole goal is to get glory, to show yourself superior, to get exalted treatment. And if that's who you are, the scriptures are telling us you are on a collision course with the reality of God's nature and God's future. How terrifying is it to consider that in our pride, we could think it's working. My life's turning out just how I hoped, and God could be just shaking his head. I see everything. You've hidden nothing. Well, hey, that doesn't sound very loving. That's not nice. I thought God was supposed to be nice all the time. Okay, go back to Proverbs 1. Let's finish where we left off earlier with wisdom crying out in the streets. Verse 24, because I have called and you refuse to listen, have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded. Because you have ignored all my counsel and have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. When terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster." Listen, here's what I'd say in light of Proverbs 1. Hopefully, at some point in life, at, at the grandest scale of your soul, I, I hope and I pray that you humble yourself and you see your need and dependence on God. Because what Proverbs 1 is telling us is that at some point, at some point, in this life or the next, your world is going to fall apart. And when it is, you come to find out that there's a hard brutal reality to wisdom scored, scorned. When your proud foolishness leads you to weeping, you will not find wisdom shedding an empathetic tear. You will find her saying, I called out in the streets. I begged to offer myself to anyone who was humble enough to listen and receive me. Now hear me right. God is unbelievably patient, unbelievably gracious even to the most foolish, even to a fool like me. And at some point, unrepented, our pride pushing God out and pushing God out and fighting for supremacy and fighting for God's place in our lives. At some point, God says, okay, you can have what you've asked for. At some point, wisdom says, God cannot be mocked. You reap what you sow. Which leads us to point three, the antidote to pride. What do we do about it? It affects all of us. It's dangerous both in this life and in the next. What do we do about it? Look back at Proverbs 16, 19. It is better to be of lowly spirit with the poor than divide the spoil with the proud. What's that saying? That's saying it's better to be humble than to have all the riches of the world. Proverbs 3, 34. Toward the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. Proverbs 3.34 says God gives favor to the humble. It's the, the Hebrew word that can also be translated grace. He gives undeserved favor, unmerited grace. So the question is, how do we get it? How do we be free from the indwelling sin of pride, the poison that's infected every human since the garden? Proverbs 16.19 gives us a hint. It says, better to be lowly of spirit. You know what that reminds me of? 
Jesus in, in two ways. One, just like the everything about him. And two, very specifically, the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Here's how I'd, I'd summarize it. The antidote to pride is, is what I like to call a little gospel humility two-step. You're going to need a little gospel humility two-step. Step one, you need to see yourself rightly in light of who God is. And you need to let that give you an appropriately lowly spirit. Not an insecure, low self-esteem spirit where you beat yourself up all the time. No, an appropriately accurate, correctly small spirit. God, big. Me, small. God, wise. Me, got a lot to learn. God, most beautiful, most radiant, most glorious. Me, going to live a very short time on this earth. And I'm to be honest, about a six, okay? Let's just, let's be honest. Compared to him, no matter how much you know, you know nothing. No matter how beautiful you are, you're barely noticeable. No matter how much wealth you have, you're a peasant. All God, all majesty, all glory rightly belongs to him, not to us. Any that we have is shared as a gift from him. Step one is to see yourself as rightly small in front of his glory and majesty. But by itself, it's not enough. Because if you stop there, you could just end up focused on your own smallness and your own unworthiness. You'd still be stuck in the pride trap focused on you. So gospel humility, step two. You have to see that the one and only radiant God of all glory bent low for you. That's what Philippians 2 says Jesus did. He emptied himself. He left the glory and majesty of heaven. He took on flesh as a human, lived in poverty, experienced cruelty, rejection, betrayal. He forgave without ceasing his enemies as they lied about him, as they destroyed his reputation. He allowed Roman soldiers to strip him bare. They crowned him with mockery. They ripped out his beard. He allowed them to lift him up as a fool to be mocked and spit upon. What's happening? Jesus allowed all of his gaon to be stripped from him. Why? To save us from our pride. To humble you and to love you and exalt you at the same moment. The gospel is unbelievably beautiful and powerful. In his, wisdom, he in his wisdom, he mocked the foolishness of this world where all of us are trying to puff ourselves up and prove ourselves awesome and be worthy and glorious on our own. And he said, no, 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 no. You needed the son of God to die in your place. And as you follow, as you put your faith in him, and as you follow him, as you empty it yourself, as he emptied himself for you, guess what? You get resorted back to where you can be filled up with his love and his glory and his patience and his wisdom. He humbles you and he exalts you. You entrust yourself to him. He does both. And the more you set your eyes on Jesus every day, the more your pride shrivels up like a, like a weed that's dying from the roots. Humility flows in. I, I can't puff myself up enough to fix my problems, and I don't have to. Because he lowered himself for me, I can't be good enough on my own, but he was good enough for me. What do I have to brag about? I needed Jesus to die for me. I couldn't be good enough on my own. Couldn't be smart enough. Couldn't be righteous enough beautiful enough? What do I have to complain about? The Son of God died for me. Whatever circumstances I've got, better than that. Why am I getting down on myself? The God of the universe was brought low to lift me up, to exalt me, to bring me into his family, to connect himself with me. Whatever circumstances busted in my life is small compared to that unbelievable gospel reality. Jesus emptied himself of all glory so that in repentance we could empty ourselves of our pride and find his love, his spirit, his patience filling us, filling us up to the brim, finding that his mercies are offered new every morning and the humble rejoice to receive them.